Hello and welcome. This is your host, Coach Kamul Hassan. I'm glad to say today is a big day. Augmedics presents Next Gen Leaders Virtual Summit, the largest ever summit in Bangladesh, Career Summit, in association with IPDC Finance and our strategic partners, Sensei, Jump Up in Asia, Key Leadership Institute, Wadhoni Foundation, and English Olympiad. Our goal partner is Prime Finance and Investment Limited. Our career partner, Cormo by Google. Those who, those who are students, please download the Karma by Google app and create a profile. You will get a job near your location based on your strength and skill. And our knowledge partner, rockmoney.com, youth outreach partner, youth opportunities. And this particular session brought to you by Bold and Future Icon. Today is very important day because of this, because of the topic, gender diversity and inclusion, the next big thing. And we've got wonderful I think panelists and keynote speakers. So we might have some issues on the keynote, but I think our panel members would make it up because it, it has got so diversity. So let me introduce today's moderator of the session, Arthi Moore, the founder of Key Leadership Institute from South Africa. Assalamu alaikum, namaste. How, how's everybody? Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. It's awesome to be moderating the session again. Wonderful to see all of you. Thank you. The session is yours. Please introduce the other guest and take it forward. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's exciting to have everybody back again. I cannot wait for you to meet all of the exquisite uh, panelists we have. We have amazing surprises in terms of who Coach Kamrul Hassan has brought to you. We have got people who are Bangladeshi and moved to Canada, people who've been in, in Bangladesh and moved to Australia. And we've got people from, the, from USA, we've got from Florida, we've got from Virginia, and we've got from Bangkok. So it's gonna be exciting and amazing to connect and see everybody. So as soon as they all come online, I'm going to introduce to you, we have Mr. BJ Radowski, and he is in Bangkok at the moment. We have got Dr. Jessica Ash from Florida. That's exciting because she's amazing as well. Then we've got Mrs. Mamuta Chowdhury, and she's in Canada, but was of, originally from Bangladesh. Woohoo! Oh, Bangladesh. Then we have got Mr. Dave Dalton, who's in Australia, and we might be able to, to catch up with him um, because he's just having a little bit of issues. But exciting part was he was in Bangladesh. He was one of the registrars for the University of Bangladesh. Um, and then for Dr. Luisa Akaiso, another amazing person that I've gotten to know over the last couple of years, originally from Nigeria, now in Virginia in USA. We've got the most incredible lineup for you. We're excited because this is an exciting topic. So while we're waiting for Mr. Dave to join us, what we're going to do is share with you some of our experiences and all of the excitement that we've had over the years when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Now I understand that when people say diversity and inclusion, immediately they get the wrong idea that it's all about making people apologize for the past histories of their countries and hurting people. And it's got to do with racism and all of those negative connotations. What I want to do is say to you, let's just sit back, relax and enjoy listening to the brilliance of embracing something that allows us to celebrate our humanness and who we are as people. That is what diversity and inclusion is all about. Instead of getting technical about dissecting it into what is the diverse areas, let's go back to the simplicity of at the level of respect, all people are equal. But what does that mean to us as human beings? Is that we celebrate the brilliance of every single human being that walks this earth regardless of who they are, what their age is, what their language, religion, culture, tradition, or gender is. I believe strongly that every single person deserves respect. Men deserve respect as much as women do. Women deserve respect as much as men do. So do children and older people. So when we look at it from that point of view, we understand that there is a brilliance ensconced in the human mind that is untouched by us if we allow unconscious biases, our prejudices, and all of our belief systems to hold us back from experiencing the amazing qualities that every single person brings to the fore. 
So when we look at it from that point of view, diversity and inclusion is something that is to be celebrated. It's something to be challenged and it's something you'd be curious about. And what I love is that with our panel of guests, have had so much experience in so many different areas. And when they, when they share with, with their experiences, they're showing us what we can do differently and how we can engage more meaningfully from the way we challenge our mindsets and our beliefs to the way we can coach and guide other people to the way we can embrace our people regardless of where they're at without bringing people down. So when we look at this amazing, important subject, I'm saying to you that let's sit back and relax, take copious notes. Also know that we are looking out for your questions, all of your burning questions and anything you've ever wanted to know. If it's within our power, we will answer. If not, we will ask you for solutions as well. Because after all, it is not our brains that has all the knowledge. It's everybody has got wisdom. And I found that there is something so amazing about tapping into the potential of people who ask incredible quality questions. No question is wrong. Every question is appreciated. Every question is wanted. And we will look at all of these questions and we will engage with everybody on this platform and look at how we can add value to your life. Our intention today with this panel is that we want to inspire within you a thirst, a thirst for knowledge, a thirst for wanting to get to know your fellow human beings, a thirst to know that there's more out there and that our minds are like parachutes. It works best when it's open. And I love that because I know that with every single one of you on this call, it took a lot of courage, it took a lot of, it took a lot of effort for many of you being on this You've sacrificed a lot to be on these platforms and we want to commend you and thank you for being on this platform. We are only as successful as the people we are adding value to. So from my side, I'm going to introduce to you and I'm going to give our gentleman the floor first because I believe that here we, we need to celebrate everybody since we were overpowering you with our amazing, beautiful, gorgeous ladies here. Let's give Mr. BJ, uh, Mr. Radomski, a, a big hearty welcome. If you are on our Facebook page, send him some love, some thumbs up, some, some hearts. Welcome him so he feels loved. He says that he is in the beautiful city of angels in Bangkok. Now, he was making us jealous earlier on. That's not fair, not fair. I'm just saying, originally from Canada. He is the owner of the Big Picture Inc. Now, what he does is he changes mindsets of people around the world. He used to be, he, not used to, he is, and has been for the last 14 years, a most success, successful business owner who trains managers and leaders and business owners on how to become internal coaches and how to transform the organizations. Now, I love that because it talks into transformation. So I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about what you do and how we can learn more from you. Over to you, Mr. BJ. Well, thank you. I'm confident you're going to regret starting with me. <laughs> okay. okay, stop, stop, stop. We don't want you now anymore. Who's next? Who's next? <laughs> the you know, with a, our theme here is uh, diversity and inclusion and the beauty that we can create when everyone is treated as equal, which uh, RT, mm -hmm. you said, you know, is something that you believe. Mm -hmm. um, well, we know that beliefs have always been changing over time, much like morality has, you know, and currently the, 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 the zeitgeist, currently the, the focus globally around businesses is inclusion and diversity. And I agree. I, I mean, of course, I support that. I believe in it. I stand for it. It's the reason behind I do what I do. If we had time, I would tell you that story, but it involves lots of tears for me. And with all that said, 
Oh man, it's hard sometimes. Diversity and inclusion is as as beautiful as it is for us to want to bring it in, there is a challenge to that. So as you mentioned, RT, I, I, I'm from Canada. I live in Bangkok. I'm a licensed neurosemantic trainer and executive coach. I co-founded the Coach Training Academy almost 10 years ago. We certify coaches around the world so people can get in and do this transformation. And ideally, we like to do it in groups with executive teams and management teams. And often we see we have to come down to doing it individually. And the reason to that is a challenge to diversity and inclusion is the biases that a lot of us have in our mind. And a, a, a bias is a mental shortcut. It's, it's a reaction in your brain that mm. causes uh, blindness. Like it's a type of blindness where you actually don't see what other people have. You maybe don't hear even what you have said or what other people have said. And these biases that we have inside, these shortcuts, they're continually deleting information, they're distorting information, and we're generalizing everything that happens. And the reason is because there's so much information, our brain can't analyze everything. Imagine if you had to analyze everything you did in the morning from the moment you woke up, how to brush your teeth, how to get dressed. So your brain has to develop shortcuts for you to go through life. And some of these shortcuts serve us in some situations and they cause these problems that we're trying to correct with diversity and inclusion. They come from, you know, really just from evolution, from us trying to get by. There's so much information that our, our brain creates these uh, uh, shortcuts and Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Blink, which is, a, I think, a pretty easy read where he calls it thin slicing, where the brain just gets a thin slice and then it makes a judgment about everything else behind that thin slice. And because not only does thinking take a lot of time, but it's really hard, it burns a lot of calories. I'll show you how hard thinking is. Um, everyone who has their microphone on, what's two plus two? Anyone? Four. Oh, great. Okay. What's what's twelve times twelve? One hundred forty-four. Got it. Oh, well done. That's it. What's, though. 20, what's twenty-three <laughs> times seventeen? Oh no. Right. <laughs> So you see how hard that becomes. No, stop traumatizing us now. Pardon? Uh, so the, the two times two. And I say stop traumatizing us now with Matt. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the two times two didn't require thinking. It was just a reaction. Your brain, you just, your body, you just reacted. Two times two is four. And then when we said, what's 12 times 12? Well, Dr. Jessica took a second, but you remembered it. You remember, oh, 12 times 12 is 144. But 23 times 17 is thinking. And thinking is hard. And thinking takes energy. And your body doesn't like all the time and energy to do thinking. So that's why we've developed these, these reactions, these memories to guide us, and these biases. And so it's because of these biases that have been perpetuated through us, through how that we've grown up, what we've seen in, in media, what we've seen in movies, what we've read in newspapers, just all of these things that we have seen have created these neural pathways that has us live most of our life like two times two, or maybe 12 times 12. And two times two and 12 times 12 is a bias that gets in the way of inclusion and diversity. So what do we need to do? You know, it's pretty hard to go in there and rewrite all of your biases so that you can treat people as equals. 
what we do is look at situations where our bias might most likely get in our way and then develop a system that kind of holds us in check as best we can. Because I don't know if any of us will ever get to the point where we truly move and live without any bias. So the, maybe the best we can hope for is we develop some systems that hold us in check. So when we're in a situation like in an interview or sitting in a board meeting, we have systems and structures that override the failings of our own cognitive system. So are you regretting having me go first yet? Absolutely not. I love intriguing conversations because All it right. always stimulates me to think differently. Okay, always. So, so there's my challenge. I'd like but the rest of you now to say how we actually do it. Be before we, we catch anybody else, we just want to double check. Dave, can you hear us? I see Dave has joined us. Dave, can you hear us? No? I can hear you. you I can hear you well, okay. yes. I can hear uh, you, yes. Yay, Dave. I'm unmuted. Dave, I can hear. while you're on here, can we catch you for a bit? You can hear me. Fantastic. Yes, we can hear you. Do yes. Clearly. Yes. Excellent. Oh, okay, great. stunning. Yes. Good. <laughs> that is stunning. Yes. Okay, Dave. While <laughs> while we've got you on, can you give us quickly um, at least twenty minutes of yeah. your keynote? Are you able to do that for us? I would be delighted. I certainly can. Thank you. Well, it's good to join you, at least by phone, and to take part in this, this good discussion. So thank you very much. And I hope that the um, sound holds out for the 20 minutes or so. So thank you very much, colleagues. You can hear me well, then. I'm audible. That's good. Good. OK. Well, um, so thank you for the invitation to take part in this discussion about leadership in relation to gender equality and um, inclusion and diversity. And my contribution to the discussion was to talk about um, what you might call a case study of an international institution hosted in Bangladesh that sets out to promote inclusive and diverse leadership through the education and empowerment of women. And I think one of the points I want to get across is the link between the importance of gender equality and other types of social can you hear me yes we can but we're looking at your your hand or your thumb or something over the camera we can't see you probably oh. his ears so the case study is about <laughs> oh, Asia perfect. University for Women, which um, draws students from across Asia and the Middle East. And is that better? Again, he's back with his ears. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. So talking about Asian University for Women, um, institution mm. Yeah, that's okay. And it draws students from across Asia and the Middle East. And it recruits women who are interested in social justice and have an attitude for leadership. It also includes many who come from disadvantaged or even extremely disadvantaged backgrounds and who, but for the educational opportunity they get, might not otherwise be able to use their talents at all. And these students all come together to live in a highly diverse international community. So this is a story I want to tell you. For a, for a start, it's an all-female community of students. And we've often been asked, why did you decide to have an all-female community of students? And when the university was designed, the view was taken that it was important to give females a space to learn, to gain confidence, and to find their voices as individuals and as potential leaders, to learn to be assertive in that space. 
There was also a risk that that was recognized that university education, even when delivered by female teachers, might just reinforce traditional views of the roles and career paths that females should take and the subjects that they should study, maybe through unconscious bias. It's striking to see the value of men to the achievement of gender equality. About half the faculty at AUW is male, along with many support staff, and students also have contact with men through work placements, internships, and community projects. And it's touching to see fathers and brothers encourage their daughters and sisters to succeed with their studies and to go on to benefit society, their families and themselves. Now, most of the students are taking two years of access studies, first of all, and then they go on to do um, an undergraduate degree. So they may well be with the university for, um, in most cases, four to um, five years. And um, it's a liberal arts and sciences program of study as well. It's interesting to see liberal arts interpreted for a developing country. And so what we're trying to do there is to provide broad and deep education and to encourage the development of critical thinking skills and also so then opportunities for work experience. The university is mostly a residential community and that is significant and it's a really intensive life inside the classroom and outside the classroom. There's not really much hiding space. You have to engage with people you might have avoided in another environment. You'll find yourself very often with people from backgrounds very different from your own and even from communities that you may have grown up in conflict with. Some of the students come from war zones. Um, quite a number are from refugee backgrounds. The students from poor backgrounds, the shop floors of guard factories, or tea estate workers in Bangladesh. And others come from well-off middle-class families. So you may wonder what happens when you bring all those people together from so many backgrounds. And at the start, I think sometimes students don't really like each other very much. And that feeling may be accentuated by homesickness, adding to a sense of defensiveness. Well, to cut a long story short, this is a model of education as transformation. Something significant happens during several years in that environment, students generally deepen their appreciation of the value of diversity of cultures and points of view. And just to give you an example, I met students from the Tamil and Sinhalese communities who said that at first they could see little value in each other, but they came over the years to appreciate each other and to understand what each suffered through the prevailing conflict in Sri Lanka. So there was a coming together how does that happen? Partly and crucially, when they arrive, students are at least interested to some extent in learning from each other. So in a way, they're self-selecting. You wouldn't go to an international community of some students if you weren't interested to some extent in the first place. But it also happens partly through formal education developing critical thinking skills and learning to see the world from different perspectives. And you see how students learn to help each other to express ideas through conversation in class and outside. And in a way, that's what leadership is about, an ongoing conversation where people help each other to draw out their talents and ideas and to move forward. And here's just an example for you of this as well. Our university councillor observed that the study of history in the university seems to be an enlightening influence that helps to break down ethnic barriers. Students learn that written history is biased. They learn that the writers of history have their own agenda. 
From Afghanistan, the Pashtun students have come to understand that the Hazara have been essentially written out of Afghan history. And learning how history is written has helped students recognize that many ideas of racial and ethnic division they held upon arrival at university are false and often created or encouraged by political influences. And then it's happening through other ways as well, through sport, and actually there's universal practice of karate in the first two years on access programs, but the sport is inclusive and friendly rather than exclusive. And it's designed to help build up confidence and you know, an appropriate level of assertion. It happens through music, dance, drama and clubs, through individual counselling and facilitated group discussions about personal and community well-being. And also students take on leadership roles in the student government or looking after each other in the residences. But it also happens through student teamwork in community projects and placements. Some of the students have partnered in social development projects with female sex workers in Dhaka. Um, and they were creating educational opportunities and trying to make better lives for themselves in extremely difficult and dehumanizing conditions. These students have said that they learned so much from the sex workers who were among the most often rejected and least valued in society, but have turned out to have so much unrecognized talent. And I think these students have experienced the truth of a spiritual message that you think you're giving a gift to someone else, and then it turns out you yourself have received the gift. So let's fast forward to what's happened to some of these students post-graduation. Last year, there was an alumni gathering in Hong Kong with some of the first graduates of the university who are enjoying making their way in their careers around the world and across cultures. The top graduates are impressive. They've appreciated their educational opportunities and lived student life to the full. I met one, a Palestinian, who is an activist for gender equality in Palestine. She's developing an academic career in Germany, and she's learning Korean in Germany. Her life is enriched, and so is that of other graduates similar to her. There are graduates who become teachers helping upcoming generations, and I wanted just to appreciate organizations like Teach for Bangladesh that facilitate opportunities for careers in learning, so the role modeling goes from generation to generation. Well, now, to put this into a wider context, this recognition of the importance of diversity and inclusion is, of course, widely shared in educational institutions around the world. There are so many examples. Decades ago, the United World Colleges were founded to bring people, nations, and cultures together for peace and a sustainable future. And they long ago anticipated the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, where diversity, inclusion, and gender equality are at the heart. And then to give another example, Brack University, where I'm working now, it's a different context. It has a largely day population of students, males and females together with an improving gender balance as well. But there's a residential semester where the undergraduates have a valuable opportunity for transformational experience. They live together and they learn to appreciate each other. There's an exercise for students to take on the roles of support staff so they'll help to cook or clean for a few days so that they can realize the value and the challenges of the people they might perhaps overlooked or dismissed. The Child Haven Orphanage in Chittagong has brought up children, young people from their early years to cherish their own cultures and beliefs and those of others can celebrate the various festivals through the year. 
The business case for investment in diversity and inclusion has been made so many times and in so many ways. You can find so many studies that, for instance, show the higher levels of employee engagement that result from teams, whether in you in inclusion. Now, a leader needs many qualities, drive, adaptability, versatility. They should be idealistic, but grounded <coughs> at the same time. They need insight, the ability to make good decisions, to know when to take calculated risks, when to assert themselves, and when to hold back to enable others to succeed. They have to work hard. They need communication skills and political skills. And they need to be really interested in others and keen to see them fulfilled as members of the community or the organization. There's a well articulated case for the social and economic benefits of the inclusion of any number of groups and people. The foundation of AUW was motivated by the need to reverse the massive underutilization of female leadership talent, half the world's population. And the foundations of AUW and Brack University were encouraged by a report from UNESCO and the World Bank in the year 2000 called Perilum Promise about the vital role of higher education in the social, cultural, spiritual, and economic progress of developing countries and gender equality and female empowerment recognized as central. The founder of Grax, Sophia Arbor, realized that women are drivers of sustainable development and social change. And now Brack is renowned for its work to help women gain empowerment. But just a couple of reflections. I worked some years ago for a performing arts institution in London, Trinity Laban Conservatoire of Music and Dance. And it was partly a legacy of a great man Rudolf Laban. He was a man of extraordinary achievement, a founder of European modern dance, a student of physical movement, and even an early management consultant in the 1950s. He was interested in how to get people to move together in harmony to benefit their organizations and themselves. And it's a delight to watch a cohesive team where people move in a kind of harmony. You can see them reinforcing and complementing each other. Contrast that with what you see in teams that have given themselves up to politics or backbiting. The physical movement is closed, furtive, suspicious. There are many leaders out there who unfortunately become anti-leaders because they get too busy playing political games or failing to hold others back from playing politics, and they end up undermining their organizations and encouraging cliques. So to draw this to a conclusion, discussion about diversity and inclusion takes us to a model of leadership, primarily as service to others. It's assertive, but it's about service. It's based on real interest in people and seeking out the value that each person can bring. And we have to be able to work globally across cultures and nationalities. And that's what Brack University is trying to do. That's what AUW is trying to do. Actually, I think universities right across the world are trying to do that. Really, we can't afford to be distracted by prejudices, biases, barriers, social inclusion, tribalism, people who want to build walls or to deal only with other people like them. It's really challenging to build inclusive organizations, communities or teams, because you have to start by looking honestly and constructively at yourself. An organization can invest in all sorts of schemes and initiatives in the name of social inclusion and celebrating diversity. But in the end, it has to be grounded in driven, 
self-critical, self-reflective commitment, or it will be hollow and can't fully succeed. It has to be genuine. So thank you very much. You know, I've, I've said all that in the faith that you can hear some of it. And thank you very much. Yeah, we heard you loud and clearly, Dave. That was really inspiring. Thank you for that. Uh, so it seems that Arthi. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dave, for the, for the wonderful information. And also, since I'm here in Bangladesh, and also know a lot about it, and the state of medicine, AUW is a wonderful university for a woman. Yeah. And I have done quite a couple of seminars in that university regarding the leadership role of women. Uh, so it is a fantastic information to them. Thanks, Dave. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I, I love I love the teamwork here because I got kicked out. But I love that everybody was so so. There was such a beautiful flow. I love that about this team. So I am back. Thank you, Dave, for the most intriguing um, information. I mean, I learned a lot. And I did not realize the impact of what was being done in Bangladesh, especially for with the university, um, the women's university. I think it's incredible because it's a journey that a lot of us take for granted. But there are so many people working behind the scenes to level the injustices that we find in different areas. Now, one of the most important parts that, that kept coming up is the need for a woman to be included in, in this journey. Now, nobody's saying that men do not deserve development. Nobody's saying that men don't need encouragement. We're just saying that it makes sense to, to develop people who never had opp some opportunities before. And now that the world is opening up to them, let's encourage them, guide them and support them. And I think the most amazing person to address this would be Mrs. Chowdhury because I have inside information and all the excitement yeah. about her. Um, and I think that we need to put her in the spotlight because she is actually one of the leading women, lady golf captain of the Bangladeshi Golf Federation. So she knows yeah. a thing or two about some of the areas of what she's done to overcome how she's engaged meaningfully and not used her gender to hold her back now i love that about her and i would love for you to speak a little bit into it but more than just the golfing side there's more to you you sure. also understand what what the bangladeshi government has put into place for the upliftment of uh, of everybody not just Absolutely. women. So we'd Absolutely. love for you to touch on that as well. So over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Arti. And I just want to say first is assalamu alaikum and a very good evening to all the wonderful, talented team members and also the students. Uh, tonight, this evening, I'm going to talk about, as Arti said, about uh, uh, women leadership and empowerment in Bangladesh, where we are struggling, uh, I mean, women are struggling and they're trying to get up to the ladders. But, so I just want to give you the in, a little bit inside of it. And of course, what are the Bang what are the initiatives and the commitments the Bangladesh government has taken in, in consideration? And so that's how we are moving. So I start with the thing, you know, like, uh, first, I, I, I would just like to tell you that leadership is not a person or a position it is a complex moral relationship between people based on trust obligation commitment emotion and the shared vision of the good gender diversity and inclusion the next big thing to be accepted as leaders women often must walk a fine line between 
opposing sets of expectations. In the overview of the gender diversity and inclusion of women leadership in the society has been indicated that women are more transformational than men leaders, no offense to the men colleagues. They function as a role model for the subordinates. They inspire their team members and spend a lot of time coaching them uh, with, the, with the team members. They also cared a lot about their personal development as well. A preference for a familiar can keep these types of leader from initiating or embracing changes. Bangladesh has made a remarkable progress in the last 20 years in improving the lives of women and girls. Maternal mortality rates have, are, are falling, fertility rate is declining, and there is greater gender parity in school and colleges uh, enrollments. Uh, at the same time, 82% of married women suffer gender-based violence and uh, pervasive sexual violence, which prevents women from achieving their full potential to be a leader. I'm, I'm happy to inform you that we have now few hundred different services officers and soldiers in Army, Navy, and in Air Force. They are serving as a fighter pilot, commandos, gunners, and doctors. At this unprecedented time of our lives, they are also working relentlessly as a frontliner, combating this invisible enemy, coronavirus. But inshallah, we are going to see a new normal again soon. Three million Bangladeshi women are employed in the lucrative ready-made garment sectors, which is Bangladesh's largest export industry. The rapid growth of the government inter garment industry has provided a large number of formal sectorial jobs for women who comprise, comprise more than 90% of its labor force. This has significantly contributed to Bangladesh's annual GDP growth rate of more than 5% over the past decade. I'm just giving you a brief rundown. Government initiatives in gender diversity, develop and development and women leadership across the country with its programs and com uh, programs are committed. And it is by addressing many of the challenges which are women are facing in Bangladesh till today. In addition, women focused development initiatives have become a controversial issue connected with women's health and welfare. Increasing numbers of women are involved in small and medium enterprises, but there, but there remain large finance gaps, ensuring equal access to services that women face despite several government initiatives. Nevertheless, the commitments and initiatives are gradually moving ahead, like engaging women in family and community level economic activities, improved access to social services, partnership with institutions of influence, parental awareness, building on importance on education, cultural barriers to female education, uh, building capacity and awareness to identify and address success of, uh, success of justice, identifying and analyzing core problems and opportunities, and support, and support the services to, to the widows and women escaping violence. Now, I would like to mention to our next generation leaders of CKH Network Online Summit 2020, gentlemen and ladies, the key results 
for overcoming challenges for women in Bangladesh is includes promoting women's entrepreneurship, promoting food security and health communities, advocating for women's leadership in society, empowering women against gender-based violence, human rights, and the rule of law, labor rights, and supporting a culture of tolerance. Uh, Bangladeshi women have been struggling to establish their rights in family, society, and in the states. Pract practically, in the society, all the implementation of law, women are still facing discrimination, exclusion, and injustice, and have negligible influence in decision-making processes. Now, we come to the point of fixing the woman or fixing the world. Inclusion focuses on actively embracing diverse perspectives and changing the culture to reflect them, rather than simply hiring diverse employees and expecting them to fit into the existing culture. Importantly, any leader or employee can contribute to inclusion, regardless of background or demographic situations. Uh, now, there are some barriers uh, to, to, for, for leadership. Uh, do you want me to continue? The barriers uh, in Bangladesh? The Absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> So the barriers of leadership in Bangladesh, which we're facing, the women are facing now, institutional mindsets include various types of gender bias and stereotyping. When you look, look at it from its perspective, women have a long way to go. The significance of these statistics and the implications on leadership are, are cause for both concern and discussions. What is causing this gap and keeping women from advancing to the top? There are four types of barriers to leadership for women. That is, one is structural barriers, institutional mindsets, individual mindsets, and lifestyle choices. First, I come with the structural barriers. It includes lack of access to important in, uh, informal networks, such as the golf course, as we have mentioned, sporting events, or simple after work coffee or tea. Men assume that women don't want to take part in these types of events, so they don't invite them. Golf has been the standard means of building client relationship in case and still is today in many, in, many, in many industries. Even though many women now play golf, I do. And as Arthur said, that I am the lady golf captain at Bangladesh Golf Federation. Uh, this golfing practice is still a predominantly male bashir. In golf, it's the default method of building client relationships at your organization. It I think like we have it. lost her, but I, I think what she was saying had a lot of value and added to a lot of the questions that's being asked right now. Um, one of the things that I would like to touch on is, Dr. Louisa, one of the incredible parts of having you on this is that you specialize in an amazing, incredible show that you have founded and has been really successful looking at Nigeria and all of the issues affecting women and all the, all, the, all the areas when you're talking about leadership and diversity and inclusion, but you take diversity to another level because with your show, you talk about civility presence. So everything is about civility. I love that. For everybody that are on the show right now, listening in, we're talking about diversity and inclusion and all of the aspects. And for our listeners, for all of the students who are on here, 
understand that the conversation is addressing areas that touched on injustices, but also about what is relevant right now and how people are using diversity and inclusion to grow and evolve. It is not meant to demean anybody. We're not using this as a platform for women empowerment and upliftment um, at, <laughs> and, and leaving men behind. What we're saying is we're using this platform as creating awareness for both sides, because we believe that both sides can evolve through understanding awareness and higher consciousness. So I thought that, uh, Dr. Louisa, if you can touch on all of these, uh, all of these areas, um, I'd love for you to talk about civility, um, your civility uh, and the, its impact on diversity and inclusion. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Cameron. I want to say a big thank you to CKH Network for putting this amazing event together uh, that is so impactful and, of course, very relevant in the world today. So the big question, of course, is diversity and inclusion. But I bring something that is very unique, and I believe that is a solution um, to all of this that we're discussing. I, I'm, and I don't want anyone to throw some um, bullets on me right now, but um, I believe so much in the message that I have. Um, my name is Dr. Louisa Akaiso. Some of you have not met me yet, and I am a master civility trainer. Um, a woman development advocate, and of course, a leadership expert um, over here in Virginia. And I work with uh, women leaders all over the world and also bring civility, um, diversity and inclusion, conflict resolution, workplace solutions really to the corporate space. So I'm just gonna keep that short. Now, diversity is such a great topic that everyone is talking about today, but I permit me to say that um, in as much as diversity is so important because it's the differences among individuals, maybe in a group or a unit or an attribute or set of attributes, um, diversity cannot be completed without civility. When we think about inclusion, and in order for us to be able to move from just being diversified, but being inclusive, we have to have a look, first of all, at biases that are in place. And I think that biases can be um, a blockage to success, to moving forward, as it has um, its foundation in our mindset and our programming. So we have to have a look at that. So when we, try to use the tool of civility to solve diversity and inclusion problems. We are not just focusing on specific issues, which of course are important like race and gender, but we focus on empathy. We focus on respect. Um, we focus on, you know, how treating others the way you want to be treated, you know, really building a respectful society or a respectful workplace, it depends on where you want to apply this. Um, and so true inclusion cannot be done without civility. Um, true inclusion looks into um, positive people's treatment. You know, people are so concerned about what you think about them. So really, if we're trying to move everyone from just being diversified to having a true inclusion, we have to have a look at civility and diversity together, because that's what's going to help to create not only an inclusive environment, but an innovative culture. Now, civility uh, might be foreign to some of us. Um, like I said, uh, but civility, simply put, is focused on positive people's treatment. Uh, civility, it's um, the golden rule, treating others the way that you want to be treated, even though sometimes I find that the golden rule in some cases, you have to be extremely sensitive because if you're working with an individual who is not able to think for themselves, they might not really know what is good for them. So you, you always have to be there and um, analyze what the situation is at that point, whether it is fair enough uh, for you to treat them um, maybe the way that they would love to be treated. Now, civility, of course, 
reflects general concerns for others because it speaks to the behavior that helps to preserve mutual respect in the society. So let's bring it back home. Of course, we're talking about gender here and gender diversity. First of all, I want to say that women need to be celebrated. Um, and I know I'm not saying that men shouldn't be celebrated, but I think women need to be celebrated. And, you know, um, let me just kind of share um, a quote that at any time that I think about that quote, it really stirs me up. And that was by James Brown. And he said that this is a man's world. And even though women are here, it is designed for men. Women are just filling up where it is needed. I thought that brought me a lot of discomfort because I think that it is important for us to begin to educate people on the uniqueness of the woman, the role that the woman plays in the society and why it's so important for all of us to not tolerate women. Hi, I'm back again. I just got cut. I'm so sorry. Who? No. Because I don't know, something happened in from the studio. I just got cut. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Chowdhury. Okay. Louisa is just finishing talking sorry. at the moment. Is it, sorry. No, no problem. Is it possible just to mute for a few minutes? We'll bring you back on again sure. as well. Sure, sure. sure. Thank sure. you. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. Sorry, Jessica. Go on. So I think that the major problem is that women themselves are not in tune with their identity. They're not in tune with their role and their purpose. And so when they are faced with a lot of these barriers every single day, whether it's through their culture, um, to meet out on the definition. Can you hear me? Sorry, Louisa, we, we can't oh, hear you. Oh, okay. It's For some reason. There is some noise coming. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there seems to be um, some interference. Okay, try again. Hello, can you hear me? Um, yes, oh, perfect. Go okay. for it. Okay. So I would say that um, I find that what the challenge is is that women or girls are not in tune with their true identity. And so they miss what their role and their purpose should be. So every day when they're faced with a lot of barriers from their cultures, from the society, um, you know, it gets in the way of them really being the best that they should be. Now, when we have a look at stability, stability, of course, is a choice. It, it's a choice because you can decide to be civil and you might decide not to. But the good side is that stability, you embrace it will be able to help us to connect a lot better with others and help us build great relationships, of course, which would contribute and increase um, our trust rate, our credibility, and make people feel comfortable to be around you. So I believe that stability, we cannot take stability out of this conversation. Um, in as much as diversity and inclusion is so important, let us kind of look at it, you know, uh, look at inclusion in a broader uh, point of view of bringing in respect and empathy, and of course, understanding of everyone around us. And that's the only way we'll be able to thrive, regardless of what our cultural background might be, our religious beliefs might be, our age, our gender, um, you know, might be our sexual identity. When we have civility in place, we are able to move from not diversity to complete inclusion. Thank you so much. I love what you've said there. And yes, everybody should be celebrated. I believe that we're also at a point where we have forgotten to celebrate men as well. In our quest to, to empower and to, to balance out injustices, I'm just putting it out there because I have sons and I believe that gentlemen are created by their mothers because men will treat women in the same way as they watch how a woman in their life allows them to be treated by the man in their life. So if we think about it, 
men should step up in their ability to connect on a level of respect and understanding for the thinking that is unique to the person in the same way that women connect to men in their experiences which is unique to that person and if we looked at diversity and inclusion not as a women only thing it's gender equality gender meaning men and women so for a lot of our uh, for a lot of our students on here who think that this is a men bashing uh, session we apologize it's not it is just a very open conversation of understanding where our world has taken us to and how people have been removed from opportunities and when you listen to what uh, BJ and what uh, Dave was talking about earlier on there are incredible men out there who are doing their best to level the playing field and nobody says that each person is equal to anybody there's no such thing a man and a woman cannot be equal to each other because there is a brilliance there's a nurturing power of women and there's a masculine a uh, strategic thinking side to men that if you bring the both together creates a powerful yin yang effect we cannot we cannot disregard that what we're saying is let's look at the areas that just that needs more attention more development more improvement and if we take it from that point of view it'll be incredible to actually bring on dr jessica because she's been so patient with all of us and we want to hear from her because the incredible part is she talks about mindset but she also talks about the importance of values now what's amazing about listening to her is that she's been able to guide this topic on different areas she runs an ngo which is global mobility and she's encouraging people in emerging countries and nations to develop themselves she takes it a step further where she helps people to actually I'm um, get to the point where she supports women scholars to develop in uh, to get published in first tier uh, academic publications. So if you're a student on this, understand that your ability to succeed in this world is not limited to to the th your circumstances. It's limited to your belief systems and the mindset that you embody to understand that there is no glass ceiling effect. the glass ceiling is something that is has been ingrained in us in our beliefs and our thoughts and the way we limit ourselves personally it's not men that hold us back and it's not women that are taking away opportunities if you look at glass it can be shattered it is see through it is transparent you can break it so whatever is holding you back in terms of mindset is your choice so don't sit there and feel sorry for yourself listen to the amazing panelists saying that let's balance out by encouraging and by embracing and when we look at mindset Jessica has got some really intriguing ways of describing how she's used global mobility to change this as a as a direction and a discussion so Jessica can you give us your pulse of wisdom yeah thank you Arthi for that wonderful introduction and i had a moment of imposter syndrome thinking is she talking about me uh so i i relate to this conversation on so many ways i've taken so many notes some of them academic uh some of them in those small moments that you can choose to be civil like dr luisa akaiso was mentioning and but i really just related as a mom um when we were talking about I'm a mother of a son and there was a moment in high school when uh my son was playing video games and he was sitting next to his girlfriend and he said go make me a sandwich and I, <laughs> I went I took that remote control out of his hand threw it in the trash can I and I said you get up and you can go make lunch for all of us <laughs> so um raising a son and being a mother does have a, a big impact on on how uh men end up teaching uh in uh treating their partners um so that was just a, an aside as a kind of a uh to make everybody laugh um so academically where i'm relating to this conversation there's so many things we could talk about but what my first degree was in anthropology and um when we look from an anthropological perspective uh we talk about the quest for resources and each group 
is out for resources. And the more resources you have as a group, the more successful you are. Well, the implication of that is that whoever is not in your group will have less resources if you're successful. And so if on this academic level, we can not other people, not say, not say them, if, if we can include a larger group in the we, then we all have more resources and, and there is no them, it's all us. You know, but that's very academic. And um, I was really uh, impressed with uh, Madam Mahu, I'm gonna say her name right, Mahmuda Chowdhury, the way she so diplomatically um, discussed the, the trials and tribulations that women are having right now in Bangladesh. Um, I, I was very impressed. And, and Dave's story about the school and the successes he's had. Uh, so where I'm going with this is that, you know, I'm kind of bringing all of it together. And I, and I think about small moments of civility and, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, let's everybody define us as we, um, but what does that look like on the ground and in the small moments for students? Uh, and I had a, a, a great friend uh, arrive here, arrive in Ohio, actually, from India. And she was very nervous and she was moving here. And when she moved into her neighborhood, she said, I I'm nothing like anybody around me. And I... And I said, okay, so if you're afraid, maybe they're afraid too. And fear is from not really knowing. And so reach out to them and, and make something for your neighbors and just be nice to them. Maybe, you know, they don't know how to approach you. And she did that. And when she did that, she created a diverse neighborhood and they all started talking about different things that people bake or you know how different things the the way you raise your children and so it's it's small moments like that that where we can choose to be civil and overcome the awkwardness there's often awkwardness when two different groups are learning to become we and we have to um, overcome that awkwardness in order to get to get beyond it and to find us that we. and um so for students, what this looks like, I'll tell you, I, I run a pro, I've run a program in Middletown, Ohio. I teach international students who are often privileged. They often come from wealthy backgrounds. And when they um, started coming here five or six years ago to Middletown, Ohio, one of the poorest communities in the country with high rates of um, crystal meth addiction, the the international students who had been privileged were walking into the Walmart where many of the locals worked and it was a very poor area and the international students were just acting privileged and you know some of it was linguistic like uh, go get me that bed bedspread and they they weren't necessarily trying to be dismissive but they were and as their leader and as their teacher I started implementing programs where the uh, the privileged students were volunteering for the at-risk and marginalized people in Middletown. And the, my favorite program was where the international students were reading and performing puppet shows with these um, at-risk K through third graders. And they all had so much fun. And it, was, it wasn't them, th in, in us anymore, it, it was all we, and they were talking about, you know, the little kids were saying, mom, did you know that if I dig through the hole, I'll go all the way to China? And to, to have a third grader say that was just really cute. And then, um, you know, everybody was growing from their involvement in that program. And so as I encourage every student to reach out to uh, a group, somebody in your neighborhood who may not have as much power as you, whether that's a, a woman or somebody from a, a, a lower 
or a linguistic background that has lower status than yours and start that conversation on on your level overcome your own awkwardness and make your group of of we bigger that's just kind of an introduction there's so many uh, oh you know i do have another layer i can go on to and that is um i bj and dave were talking about leadership and, well, everybody's been talking about leadership and how that plays a role here. And uh, as a an, as CEO of an NGO, I I have certain skill sets and I don't have others. And I know that I'm not a good statistician. Statistician. I got twelve times twelve, but that's about as far as I can go. And I know that my brain doesn't work like a statistician's. And I, when I'm in uh, uh, my, the chair of my dissertation committee was a statistician and, and she used to say, you don't have enough data. You don't have enough data. Well, that's what statisticians always say. There's never enough data. They're always after more data. And I, I learned so much working with this chair because her mind was just so scientifically different from mine. And, and we, often butt heads but we both learned you know that i have a different kind of data than she does but i need her on my team in fact i i need a new statistician because i just lost one but it, it took for me the uh, the ability to overcome my own bias like when someone starts saying well statistic number 376 would tell us and like my eyes start to glaze over when i start hearing those those statistics but i need to listen to them and i need someone like that on my team so i have to fight in myself to um to be to be civil on the 377th piece of data and you know because i need that person on my team to succeed and uh, it, that really brings it home for me because we all have the ability to, you know, not want to listen or to think that's irrelevant. But it's not irrelevant. Just listen a little longer, be a little more civil and a little more patient. Uh, I know that my patience has paid off because I have learned from everybody here today. Thank you, Arthi, for your awesome leadership today. <laughs> You're welcome. I told you it's going to be a fun conversation. Yeah. <laughs> now, what I want to do is, I, I, you know what? I want to hear from the guys. BJ, one of the one of the most incredible things that I was looking at when I looked at your information was the depth of knowledge that you have. Now, to to coach people means that you've always got to look at what they're not saying all of the cognitive thinking and all of those areas. So I thought it'd be brilliant to ask you, what, do, how, what role does cognitive biases play and what challenges do they bring to diversity and inclusion? So I, I wanna pick your brain on your experience and your wisdom on that part. I wanna learn. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for that question, Arti, because it links to some of the comments I, I think that we've heard from other people share. And one of them, you know, our keynote to Dave, when he closed with the line that, you know, as leaders, <clears throat> you need to look at yourself. Well, one of the worst biases is the bias bias, which is I don't have the bias, you have the bias. <laughs> and so when we're looking at ourselves, <clears throat> we're looking at ourselves through a bias. And, and so it's how to cut through that. And, you know, um, similar to uh, a line that uh, Jessica was closing with on the know them and all us, it's all us on what level. And so the, the questioning is coming in. It starts first, I guess, with the realization that um, how many conversations are taking place here tonight? depends on how many people are participating. We're all living in our own matrix. And so, you know, with Dr. Louise's comment about the golden rule, 
I don't know how another person wants to be treat, treated until we fully explore it. I don't know a person's bias until I fully explore it. It's until we can enter someone's matrix, if we can use that movie as a metaphor, to see what is their belief about women, what is their belief about age, what is their belief about uh, um, 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 uh, geographical background, what is their belief about educational background. And it's as we, and this is where the transformation takes place in the work we do, is as we fully explore and get to the heart of that issue and dig down that we can bring that up and shine some light on it, then is that is where we can start to make the biggest difference. And it, and that's where in a group, it's sometimes hard. It's sometimes hard to cut through to the core of every individual when we're all in our own matrix. Every word has a different meaning to each one of us because a word is a metaphor for a meaning. A word is not a meaning in itself. And so this is where some of the time is required when we're really looking to transform organizations to do that, to have the skills to do, to do that deep dive. Does that help a little, Arthi? Oh, I love that. I love that because when people talk about unconscious biases, so I'm, I'm in South Africa, which means that we've got the best of every kind of racism, prejudice, women, <laughs> women abuse, men abuse, every injustice yeah. you could think of, and it's still current, it's still fresh. There's a lot of anger, a lot of hatred, a lot of pain. Yes. But on the other side of it, there's a lot of growth, there's a lot of harmony, there's a lot of beauty, there's a lot of coming together of people, there's a lot of understanding and healing that's going on. And so when you're talking about um, cognitive beliefs and thinking and the, and the biases, we don't realize that it takes time in reprogramming. Now, a lot of the a lot of leaders will tell us there's a lot we've got to unlearn, relearn, and then learn again because we've learned different ways of believing and programming. Because if you take a step back, think of a child. A baby is born if, as an innocent, may, clean if slate. I if I may interrupt, just yeah. one thing. It takes a lot of time. Yes. Now, that can be a stumbling block for a lot of people. It does not necessarily take a lot of time to create a new belief. When Jessica's mm -hmm. Indian friend went to the neighbor and brought them a bowl of curry for the first time, that didn't take time. It took an action. So it can take time. It can be repetition. Yes. Or it can be a significant event that can create a neural pathway exactly. in an instant. You only have to be in one plane crash to be afraid of flying. It doesn't take time, necessarily. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't mean to, I wanted to no, step on. But what it does is takes decision, right? It takes yes. courage and it takes time for people to build the courage to make the decision before they can even take that step. And so when you look at it, a lot of people will hold back and hold on to those beliefs because it's comfortable. And yes. that is the, the bubble that a lot of people live in. Hence why we still have control from government, from laws. That is why it's taken so long for laws to be rewritten to address injustices that works in favor of one person or group rather than all. So it does take time. The, the, the action you're talking about is individual action. But when you're yes. talking about the entire mindset change, that is a journey of connecting and developing and, and conversations. And what I loved about um, with Dave, Dave will, will be able to, to help us out with this and, and add value to it, is that with him being in a university that was um, an Asian university of women. Now, being in a, in a university just with the word woman on it, already there is a bias in terms of thinking a mindset of it's only woman and then you think about well what about the guys and when you hear men listening and in the last few sessions we've we've had this on the line why is there a university for women only and i'm thinking but when you look at the millions of other universities 
that's open to everybody else, why pick on the one? So, Dave, if you think about it, exactly what BJ is talking about, he says it does take an immediate action to change your thinking, and I agree. But when it comes to the university and your experiences, you can actually add value to one of the questions that Nisha uh, Tambusan asked on, on our chat here. She asked, what policies were put into place um, to move an organization towards gender inequality? And if you were in that university, what are some of the policies that were put in to help people to actually connect and guide and assimilate? What are your thoughts on that? If Davies will ask. policies were put into place in order to help the university to move towards gender equality? Um, one of the things, by the way, I think I would say about Asian University for women was that to some extent it was intended to be a kind of forcing house of change. So, um, you know, in the year 2000, when UNESCO and the World Bank, they produced their report on higher education developing countries, they encouraged the foundation of AUW. But AUW was seen as a practical response to what seemed to be a really frustrating and huge world problem of massive underutilization of women. And said, we need to set up, you know, an institution of this kind to help to bring about some change. So I think it does play a special part in the ecology there. But more generally, just thinking about policies and the sort of things that you try to put in place. I suppose to give one example, it would be about HR policies. And if I think perhaps back to some of the institutions I worked in London and the UK, that it helps very much to, um, for instance, to make sure that you've got an oversight structure within the university where you're actually asking questions about um, whether you're making progress with diversity, who's being appointed to positions, um, does ev how does orientation work for new staff, how do they come in, how are they introduced to the values of the organization, all sorts of things like that. So you work through the whole life cycle of a member of staff in the organization from recruitment setting out expectations there to orientation to performance management and then the decisions that are made about who gets appointed to positions who's promoted all of that kind of thing and then you have data to help you tell as well whether you actually are getting some shift in the organization and so i think that's part of what is needed um, in changing the way that a university is going to work. Um, then also, I think I've been very interested hearing the conversation, thinking you know, we've all, a lot of us have been thinking about um, how you um, get people to see themselves as they um, are. And so the importance of professional development. A lot of organizations, when the economy gets bad, they set aside professional development, they, they see it as an expendable. But it's actually really vital to bring people into the room and to have them working together in facilitated discussions to think critically about um, where their organization is and how it can um, improve and how they can be part um, of that as well. That's awesome. Thank you so much for the insight. Nishat, I hope that answered your question. We've got another question, Louisa, and this one is for you. I'm um, from Nishat as well. How does gender diversity affect decision making? So, Louisa, if you can enlighten us. Yes, absolutely. So, I think that, and I'm just going to piggyback on what uh, Dave and just talked about mm -hmm. in terms of the kind of policies that should be put in place. I was going to mention that it is also important that we should, um, you know, we're, we're able to put um, policies or good policies that will address or that equality. And of course, not just the decision making, but advocating for a more balanced. Um, male female role in a family or community. You want to think about gender diversity and decision making. Let's go back to some of the comments from Dr. Jessica and of course from Bridget talking about um, um, mindset 
and um, programming that has been ingrained, you know, in the girl child from time. Um, it just things that have, have great impact in the life of the woman or the girl, and they tend to grow with it. Now, um, as we have mentioned to us earlier, that we cannot really talk about equality because that's not a thing. But I think we can have a look at equity, um, where opportunities are available um, for everyone. And so organizations must be a lot more open to embrace um, diverse um, genders, whether it's organizations, whether it's the community, be able to embrace a lot more things or opinions or decisions from women. Because it's not like women are coming in to struggle uh, with the men, and women are just here to complement whatever that the men have. So we are both great in our own ways. In order for us to both make um, an educated, um, well-informed decision, then we have to be able to listen to both parties and bring that together. Mm. What I want to do to actually just touch on here, one of the, was, there's a lot of comments coming through. Sorry, I'm just keeping an eye on, on the comments so that we make sure that we, we include everybody. Sabrina is asking, you know, she understands what diversity is in her previous job, but now the one that she joins does not have diversity. So what reaction should she show them? And what should she do as it's her dream job? Now, one of the things that people are misunderstanding about diversity is it's not about men and women. It's not reduced to that. You have diversity in terms of learning styles, personality types, your gender, your, your sexual preference, your religious beliefs, everything that you can think of as human behavioral characteristics. Diversity in terms of your experience, your wisdom, your understanding of life, even the things that you read, the things that you develop, it is your mindset can make you so diverse from other people. So just because you're of a certain culture and a religion doesn't mean that everybody's gonna behave and think the same way as you do. So what would be, Jessica, would it be your, uh, your advice to her? Because the question is up on the screen, if you can see it, it was quite a long one. Or what would some of your advice be for that? I, I did see the question. And in fact, I just went to Facebook and followed her. <laughs> um, and uh, Sabrin is the head of the debate society, I think, uh, for where she is. And I think that that will give her a backbone in uh, her ability to um, take conversations to a place that uh, the people in her workplace might not uh, be comfortable and um, that's some of what has to happen. And um, I'll use some, I'll use the term from Dr. Luisa, the idea of civility and, you know, debate is learning to um, disagree with people politely uh, based on evidence. And the idea of, so of being assertive and um, the other leaders out there have um, heard about um, in conflict resolution, we talk about somebody who is passive for too long, eventually they store up this negative energy of not being able to voice themselves and they can quickly move from being passive to aggressive. And then the people who are aggressive just don't realize that they are the tank in the room, so to speak. But if we can move from a place of passivity or aggressiveness to a place of being assertive, where you say, I'm not comfortable with this conversation, or you say in, in these spaces where there doesn't seem to be a, a lot of diversity. And Arthi, thanks for bringing up, I mean, diversity has a lot more to do than just gender. And that was why I brought up my examples of you know, I need a statistician and it, 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 it is through this diverse thought process that something is done better. And that's why the case for diversity and inclusion is so strong is because these diverse mindsets make 
project. I think I lost you guys for a minute. Can you hear me okay? Okay, so I, I would say to Sabrin to, to take conversations, but to be assertive, not passive and not aggressive and to say, I think that this point is relevant, you know, whatever the point is. And, and, and don't spend years with the imposter syndrome and thinking that your thought process isn't valid. Um, put your thought processes out there because they are important to the entire group. You just don't know it yet. So you're going to have to be a diplomat. Absolutely. I love that as an answer. So I hope that answers your question, Sabrine. And if not, you can harass uh, Jessica because she followed you on Facebook already. And there is a question for Mrs. Chowdhury. So while you disappeared, we had a lot of comments saying that you are the nation's pride and they love you. I think you missed that. Um, Jessica, I'm not sure if you saw everybody who was raving about your smile. Louisa, they loved your hairstyle and thought that your, your glasses was very stylish. Dave, they loved your insights. They thought it was brilliant. And BJ, the guys thought that you are too cool. So I just thought my panel should be celebrated but just for a few seconds quickly, because we don't have a lot of time left. But I wanted to ask Mrs. Chowdhury an important question that was brought up by one of the students. She asks, why aren't enough leaders sponsoring highly qualified women by speaking on their behalf? That's a very interesting way to put it. But I thought that with the work that you're doing and understanding what the Bangladeshi government is doing right now, um, maybe you could add some insights into that. And then um, if you could do that for a few minutes, we'll be able to give everybody else a platform to close off before we finish. Okay. Is that okay? Thank, yeah, awesome. thank you. Thank you, Arsene. As I, as, as I was discussing about that, what are the, what are the causes? What, what is the gap keeping women from advancing to the top? And as we all know, that there is always a man behind every successful woman. And it also works the vice versa. There is a man behind every successful woman. So the question is this, there are a lot of, especially in, 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 in Bangladesh, there are a lot of barriers, you know. So that these barriers, you know, we have to, we have to focus on these barriers first. But what are the reasons? why women are what is the gap why why women are not getting the top positions of course though we are having a lot of support from the from from men as well as i said that uh, we should not differentiate the gender uh, gender thing in a wide in the workforce you know because men and women in, in, in the world we work side by side shoulder to shoulder to give support to one another but there are some particular reasons because, you know, we are women in the workforce is we are the minority, you know. So anyway, I'm just going back to the questions that what are the barriers we are stopping to be a leader in the woman? I, I mean, uh, can I come back to the question? I, I mean, this this thing, but I'm trying to this thing will, uh, answer, answer. No, no problem. This thing, the my the no thing problem. I'm going to I'm, I'm going to discuss is going to answer her questions. I'm sure. Because uh, I've only got two minutes left. Okay, sure, sure. These are there are the okay. four four Thanks. four barriers we have: the structural barriers, institutional mindsets, mm -hmm. individual mindsets, and lifestyle choices. Mm -hmm. So these uh, structural barriers include lack of access to important informal networks. Institutional mindsets include various types of gender bias and stereotyping. Uh, I, will, I will go very fast because we don't have much time. And then I come, I come to the thing. A woman can be very effective, a military leader, but her platoon may not support her because she is in a con considered to be a incongruent with femininity. Furthermore, many people associate leadership behaviors 
with agented behaviors, which are associated with stereotypical masculine traits, such as assertiveness, aggression, competitiveness, dominance, independence, and self-reliance. Well, the, uh, this, this association creates a conflict for women when they attain leadership positions because they are expected to act like a leader and thus to be accepted. To be a leader, women often must walk a fine line between opposing sets of expectation. That is, individual mindsets are throughout and behaviors women might have that holds them back. Anyway, lifestyle choices include work-life balance, family choices and uh, becoming breadwinner, care caregiver priorities. Like uh, Jessica said, she's uh, being a mom and she's doing it. These choices are not negative, but they are considered barriers because they contribute to the leadership gender gap. So uh, I think I'd better conclude to it because we don't have much time. And I hope that I could, I could, uh, I could clear out the points and which is like our Bangladesh government has taken a lot of initiatives and commitment towards the gender diversity and, uh, uh, and empowering women leadership and also to have a fruitful uh, uh, lifestyle with working with men as well. So thank you very much, Arti, uh, for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak about uh, uh, the what are the barriers and what are the uh, I mean what are the boosts we are having from the government and the support. So that's how you know, as I told you, that we have few hundreds of military personnel in the army, the woman woman army, and they are fighter pilots. You know. So anyway, uh, how I hope with this uh, the the initiatives which our government has taken, and also uh, Dave, BJ, and you and Jessica and uh, Luis, you know, all of us, if we can work together, put uh, put all this awesome mindsets together, work together, you know, we can we can see the difference. We can make a difference. This is how we have to Absolutely. proceed. Thank you very much uh, for, for, for everything. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this session. Oh, we, we had to hear from the nation's pride. Come on. Otherwise, they will just kill me on this on these chats. Like, we didn't let you finish speaking. I don't want oh, them no. to find me and harass me. Oh, now, no. I want to find out, uh, BJ, you were talking about so many things that was incredible. What would be something that you can give as advice to people who are stepping into diversity and inclusion from a coaching mindset perspective, what sort of advice can you give to them? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, well, let's look at diversity. If we don't have diversity, we have closed thinking. If we don't have closed thinking, if we have closed thinking, that's an immature thinking. And if we don't have, if we don't have mature thinking in the area of inclusion and diversity, where else? are we making very poor decisions in our organization? So the takeaway would be do a deep dive, not just what do you think, but what is the thinking behind your thinking? What is the foundation of your thinking? What is the source of your thinking? And that might be the, the gateway to open up to a higher quality of thinking in all areas. Okay. I love that answer because I've heard many coaches, uh, an amazing coach of mine said, the quality of your questions determines the quality of the actions you take, directly reflecting the quality of the results you get and the quality of the lifestyle you will have. And what you're saying resonates so much with that. It's our curiosity and our ability to ask amazing questions that makes a huge difference. I, which leads me to asking Dave, Dave, you gave an amazing keynote and a lot of amazing insights. And I feel that from your experience, you can actually share with the men on this, specifically the men on this group. And um, all of the male students who are listening, what is some of your advice that you have embodied by working with so many women? What can you tell them that will help them to connect on a different level?
Well, it's interesting, been interesting, I think, in the experience I had at Asian University for Women to see how readily it's see I'd, I'd be interested to see what um, some of the students said about this. I have talked about it with them, but how readily um, men have um, taken part in this project, you know, and they they um, were, were so deeply committed really to um, the project to promote gender equality through that university. And I see, for instance, in the roles that support staff play, support staff are often the backbone of an organization, really, and how in a way quietly they have been enabling of the work of that institution. And I think that it comes, I was asked just in the question of this week by students at Brack University, you know, how could they make the best use of their time at university? And um, they were talked about, you know, if you're willing to throw yourself into the institution to see that, you know, it's a wonderful thing to become a student in a university and um, to be prepared just to um, go in with an open disposition to listen to um, people, to help them to make the best of their own experience. So, um, you know, um, you making the best of um, of you know, to help other students to make the best of their experience and then you discover that you're learning yourself you're opening yourself up but you're also helping others to have an enriched um, educational experience and so I think it's been wonderful to see at Asian University how men and women together have been reinforcing each other and listening to each other and I think that's what I would encourage some of the men to do in their own situation they'll be surprised to find the opportunities there are if they're prepared to go in with some degree of openness and willingness to learn but to help other people to have an enriched life as well really there is such an exquisite answer I absolutely love that because listening is the key and if we are listening thoughtfully to everybody and we come in with the intention mm. of using compassion kindness and respect we can honor everybody's journeys regardless of who yeah. and where they come from. I'm, I love that. Thank you so much, Dave. I'm, Louisa, from your side, I know that there are some areas that you wanted to touch on but didn't get a chance to. What are some of your parting wisdoms to all of these amazing people on our session? Thank you, for having, and thank you everyone for being part of this uh, conference and some of that really enjoyed myself here and I've learned so much. So I would like to say that the next steps really for me would be um, for us to begin to understand the underlying issues that women and girls face by kind of um, setting up a space where they're able to um, discuss issues that are related to um, diversity or that really places special emphasis on women and girls on getting more um, active roles and more involved in society and more involved in the community. So it's great for us to have this conversation, but I think we should take it a step further to begin to create a safe space where those conversations um, can continue. I think that would be a beginning or a next step to what we just did. Thank you so much. Oh, that's incredible. I love that. Thank you so much. And Jessica, not last, not least, but more. We want to hear from you. What is some of your parting wisdoms to everybody? Because I've got a lot of people saying you're their hero too. So you've got a <laughs> bit of a following. Ah, oh, thank what you. What have you got to say to some of your fans? Uh, uh, it, message me on Facebook or LinkedIn if you're having problems with inclusivity and I may be able to help you um, navigate that in real time. Uh, so thank you for everyone. I also have a YouTube channel called uh, Project Mindset Growth. You can follow me there. Um, but I do want to say one thing to Mahmouda Chowdhury's um, comments about barriers and uh, opposing sets of behavioral norms um, to all the young women out there who are um, struggling to um, be their complete selves in an environment. There's a great book by Clarissa Pinkola Estes called Women Who Run With Will, Wolves. It's, it's a fabulous book that will help you connect with many parts of your psyche. 
Oh, see, now now you're going into alpha state and, and you know, the betas, the followers and the leaders. I love that. What I would also love is that when our speakers are done here, please go back onto this live chat, on, onto the recording, and put in your websites, your YouTube channels, and any advice or books that these youngsters can follow you, can learn from you, can be guided from you with. I have spoken to a lot of the guys in all of the other uh, other uh, sessions, and I said, please don't send me uh, hi on a messenger. That doesn't help. Connect on LinkedIn on professional platforms oh, and yeah. ask meaningful questions and 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 yeah. be guided by everybody. Demand to for everybody to share their wisdom and their guidance with you. There's incredible knowledge and wisdom in every single person here. And I want to say thank you so much for Dave. For um, coming through with your with your speech, even though it, you were having some technical issues, you still made time to be with all of us. That was awesome, BJ, for your incredible wisdom, dude, you rock. Louisa, yes, for your incredible everything, you are amazing. I absolutely love you, Jessica. Thank you so much for adding value to every single person and giving more than anybody asked for. And Mrs. Chowdhury, I had to leave this for last because you are the nation's pride. Oh, so, so thank honored. you so for honored. being an upstanding, outstanding, incredible leader that everybody is looking towards. Thank you for what you're doing to for everybody and for guiding and supporting. And from our side, we want to say thank you, Coach Kamral and all of the sponsors and every single person who made this happen. Please join our next group that is coming on in the next few minutes. It's on public speaking and is by my awesome dude. Jan Roberts is going to be hosting that one. See, behind every woman is a dude and, and behind every dude is a woman and love to support and guide each other. So let's do that. Let's support our men in the same way we support our women. So from my side, lots of love to every single one of you. We're going to sign out now so the next group can come in. Thank you, everybody. Have an amazing day or evening, wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye Thank you, Arthi. Thank you. Thank you, Arthi. You're welcome. Thank you, You're welcome. You know, you know Arthi, I just, I just wanted to add one more, uh, one more sentence uh, for, the, for all of us. Sorry about it. Uh, okay, okay. Success is the intelligence, is the power of will. But successful is the wisdom is power over will. So this is the thing we have to keep in mind. So success is intelligence, is power of will, but successful, to be successful, is the wisdom, is the power over will. With that, I conclude everything, and I, I say thank you to Arti and BJ and Dave and Louis and Jessica. Oh, nice we're getting kicked out. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.